Thank you, Kerry. Thank you, everyone, for giving me the opportunity to share my story and the story of many people. I know you, we all work in societies and with groups of people, and that is basically what I do is work with many people. The story began in 2006. And I was an emergency nurse at the Launceston General Hospital, which I'm now, as Kerry said, after hours manager. And I heard these amazing stories from this young doctor about her father's work in a remote area in Tanzania. It's a small 34-bed hospital with no running water, no electricity. Moitzer actually shared the story how when she was Working with her father, she would hold a candle while he would operate under torchlight. There was a gentleman that came to Dr. Wanani, and Dr. Wanani diagnosed him with appendicitis. There was silence. The patient said to Dr. Wanani, So are you going to let me die? So with that, Dr. Wanani got some ketamine out. He got, opened his book and he took out the appendix and he became the surgeon of the area. <laughs> Hearing those stories, I just felt impelled to help. So I gathered a group of my nursing colleagues and nurses are great at getting stuff done. So we raised enough money for a generator here in the story of the candle then we all know the waste that goes into our society, particularly in hospitals. So I went to Rotary Club and they sponsored us. No hide, no Christmas cake, I've heard you like. So I asked them and they sponsored us with a shipping container and we filled with a parade and a generator. Now with that, we all know that we give money to the other side of the world after time, we've got no idea what happened to it. It was actually curiosity, and I'm a very curious personality type anyway, but it was also a sense of respect for the people that had given to us as well as the people that had donated, collected, and given their heart. So I went over with Dr. Peter Hewitt, who was a Launceston-born, not a South African-born surgeon, and he was dying of cancer. So Peter, myself, and his daughter went over there. And so, and so I went over basically on this fact-finding mission, and I found Tanzania one of the poorest countries in the world. In 2006, it was the fifth poorest country, and it is down to 20th, now, up to 20th now. It varies with GDPs and everything else. Uh, it is one of the most stable countries in the world. Politically, it's had the longest political stability ever of every African nation. So, about 85% of the workforce is with subsistence farming. But the interesting thing is, so uh, it's divided into states. There are 57 states, like, which they call districts, and Taremi is one of them, and that comprises a population of 340,000 people, an urban population of 46,000. There were only three qualified doctors Two hospitals, it was a government hospital, 150 beds, and Dr. Wanani's. I was really privileged, you can say that, I don't know, it changed my life to go out to some communities. And this is what actually changed my life. I will never forget the day sitting under this tree and there all these people. There was no one that had heard their voice. They had no running water. They had no health care, no education. I was actually overwhelmed with grief. And I was like this little girl that just burst into tears, seeing this hopeless situation. 
orphans, poor people. Something came over me and I said, what are you going to do? Are you going to sit there and cry and have pity on these people? Or are you going to stand up and say you will help and make a difference? And from that moment on, I stood up and I said to the people, I will help you. I need your stories, and I'm here to help you. I made a page with inside myself and to the people. So often, we see people in developing worlds, particularly in abject poverty, that pretty little blonde comes along, I'll help you. Wants to save the world, it's a romantic notion, being the angel, <coughs> gets too tough and walks away. And this is the reality. And this is why the people had such a massive, massive distrust whether I would ever be back. So I came back to Australia and I thought, well, it's all very well to make a commitment to these people, but it's about being sustainable. So I set up with Peter Hewitt, the Peter Hewitt Care for Africa Foundation. We had a board of directors, developed government, massive learning curve for me. Absolutely <laughs> loved the intense learning. It was fabulous. Registered the organisation with Rotary. We could not get tax deductibility status through the Australian government. The Australian Red Cross was the last international NGO to get tax deductibility <coughs> status. So we registered the organisation with Rotary. I'm actually now quite involved with Rotary and they've been a major supporter for us with all our programs. So I'm going to actually flip back to these normal ones. So 11 years down the track, so we have a registered organisation in Australia, registered NGO in Tanzania, trustee body, Rotary. And now it's quite exciting working with the, the UN and Jenny and I are going to Tanzania in two weeks time, we'll be there meeting with them. But what they love, and this is my pride and joy, is working on this integrated community development template. So we look after a basic population base of 34,000 people and what comprises health and wellbeing. When you look at people that live in abject poverty, talk about $2 a day people living on, I will tell you now, many of our people live on, I don't know, I have to say there are subsistence farmers, there is no money, and Jenny will say that. So when you come onto a community and you think, what do they need? My days as emergency nurses has been an amazing, given me amazing tools to be able to triage. And I will talk about our water and all our programs that we work with. So it's water, sanitation, hygiene, that's the WASH program that the UN has rolled out and we work with that and in partnership with the Tanzanian government health, and I will talk about that. Education, social enterprise, they are the basic templates, but everything else is a jigsaw puzzle that fits into place with it. And it's really exciting because we have actually aligned ourselves now with the Sustainable Development Goals, which were rolled out on the September the 5th, 25th in 2005. <coughs> And that was for the country's um, set a goal to end poverty, protect the planet and ensure prosperity for all as part of a new sustainable development agenda. Each goal has specific targets to be achieved over the next 15 years. For the goals to be reached, everyone needs to do their part. Governments, private sector, civil society and people like you and me. And that's what we're doing. I'm not going to talk for hours, but they are the goals and we align ourselves with all of those goals. 
So this is a really nice template that we actually <coughs> work with with the UN. Water. It is the most confronting thing to see people that haven't got access to safe, clean water. I remain incredibly perplexed. I turn the tap on and have a drink of water. I have one here. To walk into a community, and I know Jenny has seen it, with people that do not have access to clean water. I will tell you a story. I remember it was in 2007, taking volunteers out to a community in Bizarre. It was hot, we travelled for three quarters of an hour, back of nowhere. My volunteers, we decided to do a health clinic. The children, they were so weak. It was hot, it was dry, it was famine. And the children were collapsing in class. My volunteers said to me, they would never go back. And I said, you cannot walk away from these people. They said they couldn't bear it. In this modern day and age, but you hear those stories and you think, what do you do? Do you go to bed and roll over and ignore it? Or do you stand up like I did under the tree and say, oh, we're going to get water to those people. Look at that photograph. I took that photograph. That's her drink bottle. <coughs> that was the community's drinking hole in that year. But look at the reward when you see the water. This is another story. In Matana, the women would get up at two o'clock in the morning. They would walk for hours, hours, so they could be back home with their families. And if you can see, I don't know whether you can see that boat bottom five, but that was the water that they were collecting. They couldn't even fill their buckets. It is the major cause of disease. <coughs> they can't even get water. And, you know, the wonderful thing is that we are putting water wells in. We're making a difference. And that is where our reward is. You see the water flowing. To look at that photo and you see the children lining up at schools. So we, our initial wells are in the primary schools because it's actually to bring the children to school and then they can collect water, have schooling and go home. So our statistics have gone from average of 63, 65% of school attendance, it does vary, and to 85% when we put in a well. The really interesting thing is when we do the monitoring and evaluation with the water wells, it's just interesting the impact that water has on people's lives. Like I look at water and yeah, it's you know, health and diarrhea diseases, but then you look at you know, really interesting things like they can grow plants at the school, they can grow vegetables, they can clean their classrooms, birthing mothers that have got water, because how do women <coughs> birth out in those communities without water? So it's really quite extensive and I have loved our monitoring and evaluation. We were the last organisation to actually get and I'll say grant, and that was to put in two of our water wells. Our wells go into up to 100, 150 metres, <coughs> and they are hand pumped. We are looking at developing them out and putting solar on some of them so that they can have a, a more expansive use. And we have actually put 10 deep water wells in there at the cost of 15,000. US dollars. They are incredibly expensive to put in, but they go through to the Artesian Basin. There's a big rock face that they drill through. We, have, we work with an NGO, an American non-government organisation, that does our drilling. But <coughs> people will walk for <coughs> miles. Other communities, everywhere. So we ha we're on one of our biggest things is actually to bring in the water. We also run an education program whenever we run, put in a well, we set up a well committee and there's certain criteria with their committees. They have women, men, 
health representative, school representative, health representative, disability representative, so we cover all, all aspects of society. All our signage has Care for Africa, and I always put the logo, logo is the Water is Life, and Water is Life. We're also developing water harvesting. It is very difficult to develop over there, and many people ask the question, why don't you put Gattery? So that's in a, what they call a health dispensary, which is run by a nurse in the community. The government will provide buildings, but they will not put in any water. So this is an underground tank of 70,000 litres and we have a pump system. But a lot of the places that we actually work in are only mud huts and thatched roofs. <coughs> if you're putting in clean water, you need to do sanitation. It's actually open defecation in the communities. And if you can see that top photograph, that's a photograph of school toilets. So here for Africa, that is the first rural sanitation toilets in northern Tanzania. We work with you in very close <coughs> with our design and construction of them because the thing is, is actually breaking that cycle of infection and also it's actually with the hygiene as well, which is part of the program. We find that the girls don't go to school when they're having their period and so we're working with Days for Girls, which is an Australian-based organisation and this is a social enterprise project that we're working with as well as with our sanitation and hygiene program. And now, quite lovely, this is a very basic washing facility, if you see on the left, and that is they carry the water from the well, put it in a little container and they push the stick and the water tips over. But with our sanitation toilets, once we've got those up and going, we've put hand washing facilities in those. But this is the makeshift one that we've established with the schools on the interim. Our health clinics, I've loved the health clinics, and that was the foundation of Care for Africa. Being an emergency nurse, what does an emergency nurse do when it goes to rural Africa and no health care? set up a mobile health clinic. In hindsight, it has been the best thing that we could have ever, ever done. I will tell you, I have got no education in the AHIP world, but what it did, it gave us inroads to the people. People love doctors and nurses, and they will tell you everything, and that was great. So we would actually sit and listen to the stories. And they would tell you all their health problems, and you know, they needed water, so it was basically the foundation of our fact-finding mission. And now our health clinics have become quite a sophisticated program. We, work, we have a memorandum of understanding with the Tanzanian government, and we employ more Tanzanian staff than we do Australian staff on our clinics, which is really important to do. We have a buddy system and it's reciprocal learning. And we work with clinical medical officers, their local pharmacist, a public health officer, social worker. And the social worker is incredibly important for us to work with because we deal with so many complex social issues. I'm going to sidetrack, but I tend to. Now, people will say to me, female circumcision, what are we going to do about it, Diana? The girls are all circumcised at the age of 13. I said, am I going to go in and disrupt a culture, a rites of passage that has existed since mankind? And I've been there for 10 years. But if we educate the girls, if we empower them, and they can make their own decision. Because you cannot take something away unless you give them something better. And this is where our clinics and our social worker actually gives us all those inf that information. So we will see, with a volunteer trip every year, it's 3,000 children, and they're all primary school children. We do a basic triage of the children, and we do deworming. We run an education program on deworming. 
It is the most cost effective thing you can do in the developing world. Half a cent per child. And when you're looking at children that are playing in the dirt, they walk 10 kilometres, 2 kilometres, 1 kilometre to school, only one meal a day, half a cent, it just gives those children a chance to actually digest something. We run an education program that's very tightly linked with our sanitation and we're actually now working with the government and they are stepping in and they are starting to deworm the children when we're not there, which is fantastic. Because everything we do is actually about developing capacity in the people and empowering the people. It's not us coming in, doing their work and leaving. It's about giving them that step up in life, structure and support so that they can do this themselves. And that's what underpins everything we do. So our clinics, we collect our own height and weight and arm circumference, and this becomes our basis of our data for all our monitoring and evaluation. So with our water programs each um, and breakfast programs and health as well. So this is just a typical couple of shots of our clinics. We run a GP clinic and we have nurses. So we test children for malaria, we do a lot of wounds, simple GP stuff and also, and I'll bring them through just photos and we'll see a lot of children like Mary. So Mary's a product of domestic violence and um, non-accidental burn and if you look at Mary, if you see this, this burn contracture down here, so she was 13 when this photograph was taken. So as she was getting older, her face was growing down here. How does a young lady in the back of Africa survive? They've got to carry water on their head. So we partner. I'm a great believer in partnering with people, not reinventing the wheel. So we've partnered with Rafiki, which is a Western Australian group of plastic surgeons that fly into Tanzania. And we find many children like Mary and we refer on to them. But our clinics, every year we, we follow them up. So Mary's actually had three years of operations. And we said to Mary, said, now would you like to go to boarding school? There's a lovely little boarding school in Taremi Township. Oh, she'd love to go. So it's her choice and we've got a sponsor and she's sponsored at the School of St Jude's. It's a little one, it's not the big one in Arusha. So we've actually taken her out of her family situation, but it's not offensive or treading on anyone's toes. She wanted, it was her choice. And it's just lovely. Margarita, this was in 2008 and last year. Look at Margarita's got a shop. So uh, it's uh, just beautiful stories. Little Raphael, this was in 2007, his top photograph. And now Maggie Fairland, and she, they released his little talipers. He's had a lot of physio. We've got him a bike to keep his legs strong. He has calipers. He's at boarding school because he's an orphan. And he's going to have a really bright little future. We've just set up a new program called Care for Children and this is actually a Melbourne based program run by Dr Lindy Hosking. We see many children on it. I'd like to see if you can see little Gartie with her little feet back to front. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then this little boy. So we see a lot of unusual congenital abnormalities. And they always get fixed at birth in Australia in the developing world. But these children, no one even knows they exist, let alone help them. Children with epilepsy because they're believed to be possessed by the devil. So we are actually working with them. These children, we're actually partnering with a New Zealand NGO, the Plaster House and they're based in Tanzania, in Arusha. 
So this is just a new program. So our mobile health clinic captures so much for us, whether it's the water, lack of education, which I'll stick into, these children, it's just the basis of where we work from. Now we all know education, I know you're all great lovers of education. I love education and it doesn't matter how you learn. And Judy Sneary, he was the president of Tanzania yeah. and where yes, yeah. And he was yeah. Um, and his education is it's the only way of fighting poverty and it's about empowering people. But this is just, all these photographs here are just photographs that I've taken, all my volunteers have taken. And I look at the maths class, the normal class, so very little educational aids. A lot of our teachers are only educated up to grade four. We have got a sponsorship program, teacher sponsorship which is endorsed by the World Education Fellowship Trust and UNESCO, and that is to sponsor teachers to get their further education. So Wankuru, the lady on the right as I'm looking at her, so she teaches 120 students in her class. She studied up until grade 10 at school, but she didn't pass grade 10. So we are sponsoring her to go on to do a diploma in education. Teach the teacher. So the teachers are so keen to learn. And a lot of it is just brainstorming ideas. Remember Alison Masano went home and I was there this day and she held two magnets up and they were pearl. She stood in front of the class and there was this elderly gentleman of 62 who'd been teaching in one of our community schools. There's tears rolled down his face. And he said, you know, I have taught about magnets my whole life, but I've never seen one. And the book said, I did that. It's also brainstorming ideas. We are very good at conversation, brainstorming, whereas the children are very much with rope learning. Do we to sleep? Two minutes. Education, so just sponsoring education, rebuilding the schools that have fallen down. School trips. We've had a couple of school trips that have been amazing. And our children <coughs> have integrated really well with the children. Our child sponsorship. We sponsor our Beanos. Our Beanos get hunted by the rich doctors and get, they get killed. So these children that we sponsor, it's not a major part of our program, but they are very, very vulnerable children. And little George is children with disabilities, and we support them as well. There we go. So education is the future. I took that photograph in 2006, Don't Exchange Girls for Cows, and now we've got, that was my last photograph I took last year, Education is Future. I think it's very, very powerful. <coughs> Just quickly, we run a breakfast program, very new program because our children, they're BMI's 11, 13, quite low, and so we're actually sponsoring um, growing maize and feeding in the classrooms so the children get a meal a day. Social enterprise, we all understand social enterprise. Beekeeping, they do have bees and that's what they want. So all our social enterprise programs work very closely with what the people want. Sewing groups, which are just so important in the communities. Aquaculture, protein is a major food deficit. So it's really, really important to develop some protein. And tilapia is a, they call it the marine rabbit. And grows very prolifically, very easy. We've sent over shipping containers and that has been a continuation of our medical and educational. But we look at that program quite a bit because we actually, the people need to develop their own capacity. So 
we don't send many containers now for that reason. But we send over ambulances and a tractor for the breakfast program. So just to wrap up, it's a big story. It's very complex as everything we do when you're working with whole communities. But I remember that day standing under the tree and looking at that hopeless situation and it is a lesson for us all in life. If we just focus and I just see the difference. It is phenomenal. The difference that we are making to people the other side of the world that no one else hears about. It is the most rewarding thing. And I know I have a massive, massive journey. It is a journey of many people working together. But I will tell you is that I get so much out of it myself. The people give me so much back, so thank you.